when I saw the archival of him shooting himself and then I saw this kind of very um, by turns humorous and by turns you know violent and disturbing movies he had made I thought those archives alone gave me the confidence that there was a feature film there and the rest of it was just meeting people and talking to them. Welcome to the Variety Virtual Sundance Studio presented by Audible. I am Matt Donnelly here with the director of Second Chance, Ramin Barani. So congratulations. And this is, a, you know, I mean, obviously we're so used to you in, in, in a sort of narrative, um, you know, feature lane. Um, so to come with something like Second Chance is so interesting. And, and this, this character is, is quite, is, is just that. <laughs> so how did you first find out about Richard and, and what sort of drew you to this? I was editing The White Tiger in 2020 during the COVID lockdown and um, the producers of the film, Johnny and Daniel from the Vespucci group contacted me and pitched me the idea um, about Richard, Richard Davis and Second Chance and wanted, they said they were gonna make a documentary and they wanted to know if I would be interested to make a fictional film about the same subject. And I asked them some more questions and they showed me some of the archival footage and some of the movies that Richard himself had directed. And by the end of the call, I said, well, I'm actually more interested to make the documentary. And so I sent them two short docs I'd made and they sent me a lot more materials to review, documents and um, historical facts and more of Richard's epic eight hour film that he made. And um, you know, a couple of weeks later, we got on another, another Zoom and agreed to make the film together. The, the basic premise is kind of all the, the, the sales entry you need to, to wanting to see it. But so Richard, in, in effect, invented the first concealable bulletproof vest and uh, to prove his concept um, went quite so far as, as to do what, if you could just tell us a bit about sort of how he, yeah. he sort of figure. here. Well, the way he proved that it worked was by shooting himself point blank. Uh, ultimately, he did this over 190 times. And, you know, it's pretty incredible because he was at that time an out of work pizzeria owner. He didn't have a job, he had no income. And he found himself moved um, emotionally or, or in some profound way to wanna to do something about police that were being shot at that time. And I mean, it, very inventive, very kind of a, a real, in a way, a genius character to make this thing on his own. What do you think it is about a personality that really wants to sort of engender favor with a group like that, with law enforcement? Cause it got me thinking about like Richard Jewell, and, and sort of people like that. Like, what do you think that sort of mindset is, uh, the desire to sort of belong and, and, and to stand out among a community like law enforcement? Well, one of the things that I, I uncovered in talking with him was his story about his father, which we go into in the film. His father had been in, in uh, on Iwo Jima um, in the most critical moments of World War II. And that seemed to have left an indelible mark on Richard. And it was a figure that I think he struggled in a way to I don't want to say exactly to live up to, but I do think even it goes into it in the film. So I, I think that was part of it. It's somehow in the pursuit of, of creating this image and also trying to, to introduce this product, this life-saving product, he kind of inadvertently became a prolific filmmaker. Yeah. Like yeah. With some of his own vision, which is really interesting, I think, yes. when people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, first there's just archives, let's say, archival of him shooting himself a lot and there's home movies, that's its own thing. But then Richard, did he, he recreated anyone that was saved with a second chance vest, he would call a save. And then he would invite them up to Michigan and then they would recreate their shooting. So he was doing these recreations, but he was also making comedy films. Um, he was also making, you know, films about rogue vigilante left-wing nutcases, you know, like insane hippies that were going around shooting and killing police. But he, he made these films. Some of them are, I, I think, in a way kind of sophisticated for someone who had no formal training and shooting on Super 8 or on 16 millimeter. And then as time progressed, shooting on video, editing them, he had, he culminated all these movies into something he called the eight hour epic. I think he screened it in like two hour segments in, in um, Michigan. There's photographs of a big premiere at a, at a cinema with a lot of people. And these movies became cult classics um, among police officers, but even others. I, I I was speaking to my friend, one of the producers that I work with a lot, Azimi in Paris, and some of her friends in Paris had watched these movies on YouTube. Um, 
again, as I say in the movie, they're absurd, they're humorous, but they're in a way very disturbing. Um, they're both dazzling and disturbing at the same time. If you were going to do a narrative based on, on Richard's story, who would you have cast as him? Well, it depends on what um, time period, but if, if we were to go into the middle of his life, um, I thought Nicolas Cage would be pretty awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think there is a fiction film to be made and maybe someone is going to make it. Um, if I hadn't made the doc, I'd be interested, but I feel I've exhausted my own in, in, you know, artistic curiosity in the subject. He, he was an interesting man. I mean, I, I, I admit I kind of liked him. It doesn't mean I agree with his philosophies. I, I, in, many, in many instances, I do not agree with him in his, in his philosophical take on how to handle situations. He's made a lot of mistakes. We all have. He, some of his were quite, quite um, disturbing in a way. Uh, I did like him. There was something generous about him. I think even the people in the film that he hurt, some of them still seem to have some feeling about him. Um, so that, that interested me. The contradictions of the man interested me and, and his extreme actions interested me, his humor interested me, you know. But he was also not always easy to understand. He wasn't always prepared or willing to go to certain areas. And in, in the other characters, we found excellent foils, ways to understand Richard and ways to understand his position and his ways to understand policing and violence and guns and, and characters like his second wife, Kathleen, who was so profound, or even Aaron Westrick's wife, um, she was also so deep. So some of the side characters really helped illuminate the story and the character of Richard. It's interesting, for, even when I get into the kind of questions with Aaron, the police officer, he, he says something that I found so true to people. He said, even though he knew it wasn't, wasn't real, he, he wanted to believe in the myth and he wanted to believe in the legend related to, let's say, some, some interesting um, storytelling that Richard does around the origin of his kind of, his existence as, a, as an inventor. So it was, it was, the whole thing was endlessly interesting and surprising, I guess, yeah.